Hey, episode 16, guys. Welcome back to Two Nobodies, and look who I brought back. It's our favorite, foremost nobody, the guy who has all the time in the world, Kyle Vaughn. Welcome back, Kyle, to Two Nobodies. How you been? Hey, buddy. How you doing? And I thought uh, I thought that I was the lesser of the two nobodies, and you are the foremost nobody. No, no, no. I prefer, I've, gotten, I prefer I've gotten all these comments from everybody. Everybody's like, Kyle is the man. We got to have him back. Nobody says that. Nobody's ever said that. <laughs> and the, the thing about being called the lesser nobody is there's no pressure on me. I don't know. I could just sit here and like make those fart noises with my armpits. And, ah, that's just the lesser nobody. And then the foremost nobody comes in. You come in, and you hit him with that knowledge. I'm See, ready to give you all that pressure back, though, man. I've been... These last five weeks have been tough without you. Man, you really built the brand up. Um, I've I haven't been able to watch all the episodes, but uh, the what ones I have been really, really well brand? done. Um, I don't know, just a couple of idiots having conversations <laughs> with people that are smarter than us. Um, no, but I don't think he. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Like this, it was all those episodes seem so well put together, and the conversations that I listened to were Ross and the one with Stu was, was just great. Like really, really. Really, really interesting conversation with an interesting dude and um, interesting questions. And you kind of talked to him from an angle. And he even said that he was uh, he was sort of uncomfortable with. And there's this guy who's a global expert on spines. And he, you know, you kind of put him out of his comfort zone. And awesome, awesome. I that one, you know, before the episode, I was super nervous about because I definitely looked up to him quite a bit. He was my master supervisor. Here's this world renowned spine expert and all this kind of stuff. And uh, going into the episode, very, very nervous. And yeah, I was just very caught off when he was saying how, you know, he's a- I'm asking him to talk about things that he is not an expert about and how that makes him uncomfortable. So it was just like, especially those academics who, who bring a big ego to things and just naturally have to be defensive. And we talked about that too, um, for him to, to just be like, you know, and, and feel like he can just be himself and, and and then just kind of let himself be to topics that he wasn't really familiar with or or just to kind of do this internal reflection out loud like that was a very unique experience and and I was very I felt very privileged to have kind of bring that out of him so I was um, happy yeah, that he talked was, about um maybe wanted to come back cuz I got really, I and he he would probably never share the details but he talked about working with like the richest people in the world and working with like mm. world class athletes and working with royalty and I don't know. I I think we should just needle him until we get some super interesting <laughs> stories about people that maybe we, we've all heard about. I mean, um, I don't know. He had so many good like one liners and interesting perspectives on things. Really, really enjoyed that conversation. Well, the the one that really stood out to me was when we talked about mastery because he's he's always him and I have always had conversations about that. But I never heard him frame it the way he did, where he said that these like super athletes just go to a place of murder of willing to sort of take their bodies to another level. And they're just, they're comfortable with that. They'd get to that dark place. Right. And, and he's so observant that I have no doubt that like, that is absolutely true of some of these people. Um, so it was just really interesting insights that were very new to me. And, and I think were probably new to a lot of people who follow him and, and who've kind of been taught by him. So yeah, that was a, that was a fun conversation to have. Yeah. So I don't think you miss me at all. I think that, uh, I think things are about to get a lot worse with, <laughs> with me back in the picture and I'm hoping to be in all the episodes moving forward, but, um, you know how it is with two kids, you know, brand new baby and all that stuff. It's uh, sometimes family duty calls. So I'll, I'll do my best here to be involved, uh, as you look good though. You don't have any sort of big bags under your eyes. You're looking sharp. I don't, <laughs> well, I'm not feeling not sharp, disheveled but, or whatever that word was. You used. Well, it's that's the thing about not having any hair and then kind of keeping it close cropped. The only other time I've been in a video for this series was our interview with Tim Grant, and I think I was kind of bushier, like I had a mustache and maybe mm-hmm. like a goatee or beard. Um, but when you don't have any of that stuff, it's impossible to look disheveled. I just like, <laughs> I don't even think I washed my face today. Like I, I just put a shirt on and now all of a sudden I'm not disheveled. So that's, I mean, that's one of the bonuses of sort of having the haircut that I do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no thanks. I mean, we're not getting a ton of sleep. That's for sure. And 
but you know we're happy and healthy and uh, what more could you ask good good well i'm glad you're back um this episode i wanted to talk to you about the fourth industrial revolution and so something talk something different yeah and i mean what i (laughs) when you sort of brought that up i i knew there was one and i i probably (laughs) like if you asked me three questions about it i would probably get all three of them wrong like I i barely know anything about that so I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about three more. Yeah, well, I mean, I know a little bit about these things, but I wanted to, because like, we've been talking about sort of where we want to take this podcast and, and you know, we've talked about fatherhood and masculinity, and we're going to continue talking about those things because they're absolutely relevant. And that's sort of how we generated our first set of ideas. We talked a little bit about leadership and we'll continue to talk about that. And, you know, we'll hopefully get some comedic folks on here as well and, and and so on and we have uh somebody coming in next week um a couple of organic farmers in edmonton who who kyle and i both know and have bought their products from and just exceptional exceptional people and so uh really looking forward to that but i thought we just broaden something out because i think this topic just hits everybody and from what i'm learning about it but i have so many questions that this is kind of like a almost like a primer because i really want to find people who can who can really tell us and tell our audience about many different aspects about this fourth industrial revolution and what it's going to mean to people so that's sort of my thinking behind that if that's okay yeah sounds good i mean we can just get right into it um so first industrial revolution 1700s that's been- yeah yeah, mid mid eighteenth century to about like mid nineteenth century or so. So um, yeah, mid eighteen hundreds. Um, this was like the shift from the agrarian agricultural economy to the more machine kind of economy, more industrial, where you actually now had um, you know technologies like the steam engine coming into play, where you can now use that technology to just mass produce a lot more goods. And obviously with that, you use a lot more resources. You get now a big shift of the population moving away from rural parts of, of, of their countries to more of the cities, like massive shifts to the cities. And like this is always the time whenever anybody talks about climate change and the data that, that supports climate change, they always say that that first big spike happened around the same time of the Industrial yeah. Revolution. So they use yeah. a lot more resources. They're emitting a lot more pollution. Uh, that's sort of everything that comes along with that as well. Well, I was reading like because the really the first industrial revolution started in Great Britain and the air quality because of the use of coal and and to generate the steam, um, these steam powered machines, like air quality was so terrible in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they had to address things. So that was that's the first one. And that one sort of, I think, gets a lot of the the sort of negative intention attention about like, yeah, the industrial revolution ruined things. And, you know, but it was I think it was. there were a lot of people who were afraid about what that was going to do to their livelihoods, right? Because it was going to shift people. um, You know, were there going to be jobs because of more machines, right? But you saw people just adapt and I'm sure there was great tensions around that time. I don't know. And, and maybe we could have somebody talk about that. Uh, But yeah, that was, uh, that was the, the, I think that was the revolution from my understanding that sort of typically gets most of the bad rep, but also coming into the second um, industrial revolution. So we're talking about mid 1800s coming into, you know, about the 1940s or so. And this is now where you get more oil and gas, you get the automobile, you get, um, you know, electricity, Mm. you start to get, um, different uses of materials. So it's not in the first industrial revolution, you had more steel, like there was some revolutionary practices about how to produce steel at a very efficient way. And so then now you get into the second industrial revolution, especially in year like the, the early 1900s, mid 1900s of the use of plastics and different alloy metals and, and diff, diff, different materials, right? And so you can definitely increase the productivity on that one. There's also like a shift of in the first one, you did have like labor organized a little bit differently where people were starting to move towards factories. But then in the second industrial revolution, you had more factories, it was a lot more, it it was starting to get more automated. So you had even more mass production of things. You needed a little bit less labor because you could have machines doing the work. So that was kind of in the 1940s, but we're still talking about like a hundred years to kind of make those transitions from what I gather. 
Then you start to see an accelerated pace. You start to get into the third industrial revolution, and they call this sort of the digital revolution, right? And so you now have this ability to store immense amount of data going into like the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s. You have the birth of the internet and the World Wide Web. You have you know, social dot media, com, obviously. Boom and crash. Yeah, the dot com. You have the social media, obviously. That's come into like the late you know, early 2000s, late 2000s. When did you um, first get on, uh, A, are you a big social media user? And when did you first get on it? Like what year do you think? Oh goodness. Are you, are you considering social media as like messengers as well? Um, oh, like ICQ yeah, and yeah, MSMS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I spent I think those, are, I think those are kind of social medias. I think those are early yeah. forms of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I I would spend a lot of time on MSN Messenger when I was like in I don't know, like seven and eight, trying to yeah, that's how I remember. <laughs> yeah, about ninety ninety maybe ninety seven. Yeah, okay, ninety seven okay. is when I remember ICQ, um, and then MSN Messenger. Um, I still don't have Facebook, so I have not been yeah, on that. Either. Um, I don't think you have it either. Um, mm-hmm. Twitter, I've been on for some time. Instagram, just recently because of our podcast. Um, yeah, well, when we were the word, but. <laughs> it was brutal when we were starting to brainstorm about this podcast and trying to get a bit of an online presence we sort of just stared at each other blankly because <laughs> i don't have instagram do you have instagram no i don't have instagram do you know yeah. how it works not really no. okay what about um what f- okay how about facebook i'm not on it yeah me neither okay um what's so we're TikTok? gonna get nine viewers <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's right <laughs> i think i still have a myspace account so i'll go yeah. check that out but that was about it anyway sorry to kind of no, that was exactly that was exactly the conversation, and uh, and I think to, I took I told Kyle I was like, you got to do the TikTok, like that's all you, buddy. I don't even I don't even get what that is. <laughs> it's videos. It's this short is videos. like this is the you know I feel like we're gonna sound like dan- dinosaurs here, but like this is the thing. Like apparently a lot of people get a ton of information from TikTok. I think these are just like quick videos. I think it's different from Snapchat. Snapchat what about was this Vine? thing. Isn't that exactly what Vine was? And I, I remember Vine was the one thing I was sort of interested in because there was some hilarious short like little how like how, however long a Vine video could be eleven yeah. seconds or something. There's some yeah. hilarious videos on there. Anyways, I think it goes back to revolutionary times, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry. The so fact that we're like learning in 11 second sound bits, like I think it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Good point. But it's, it is. I mean, in terms of just the amount of information that people are sharing, um, people are, you know, you have people from all corners of the globe who are, don't necessarily who can who can learn things just through watching YouTube videos as long as they have oh, access to the internet. It's I just, incredible. Yeah. I and just like, swapped out a toilet in my house. Um, and, you know, for people yeah. that don't know me, I'm an idiot. Like, I to, I can't do stuff. But I just, like, YouTube how to swap out a toilet. And it's gross, but it's pretty easy. Um, and 100% internet. Most of the stuff I do, internet. Like, every single time. Like, learning how to podcast, internet. Like just learning how to do anything. Internet and, and, like, YouTube, it's insane. And so think about what that does just in terms of like the learning curve. It just, it's exponentially yeah. like faster, right? Yeah. It's probably not the best way of saying it, but you know what I mean? Just the growth totally. and, and the ability for people to learn and the access to learning is incredible. So so we're seeing this third, in, this third revolution and now people are talking about a fourth and there's not, my understanding is there's not a complete consensus on this um, that whether we are truly going to be in a fourth or whether we're in the early stages right now of a fourth, but because there are some of these sort of enabling technologies like artificial intelligence, which is accelerated. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more. We have nanotechnology. So being able to produce things at a really, really micro scale, right? Um, quantum computing, just the speed at which you can send information is incredible. You have, um, You know, if you think about the way we move people, you know, autonomous vehicles is going to be a revolutionary thing, right? And and just being able to produce tons of, uh, utilize so much data to be able to send vehicles different places. The internet of things, the fact that everything is sort of connected, you know, all your devices are connected to the internet and and that just increases access and productivity. So people are saying like the, there's these enabling technologies that it's just going to create so much disruption and it's already happening, so much disruption in every sector of the economy mm-hmm. that it's like in any, like like nothing else. We've never seen this kind of, um, th- this kind of disruption and growth and change 
in such a short amount of time. And so, so, you know, and that, that is, that is creating some anxieties from when I, what I, I mean, when I first started reading, reading about this and, you know, especially artificial intelligence, I think a lot of people, your mindset just goes, well, what's going to happen to their jobs, right? I think that's just a natural sort of line of thinking. But, but you know, what's, what's just going to happen with society going forward? What are we going to kind of look like? All these kind of Terminator. questions. This is the start yeah. of, remember in, uh, when Skynet becomes self-aware in Terminator? I have not seen Terminator. I, mean, oh. I just admitted that on YouTube, so that's oh, great. Man. Yeah, you got to watch yeah. those movies; are great. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's the whole thing about Terminator. That there's this advanced. I can't remember now because it's been a couple of years. But there's like this advanced um, AI system that becomes self-aware, and that's the start of Terminator. Mm. And all of a sudden, there's machines time traveling and all that stuff. But you know, so whatever. I'm uh, I'm just joking around. But I mean, that's if you think about AI and when people like um isn't it Elon Musk that talks about it and and he says like we need to be afraid like we need to be yeah, concerned he said about recently. ai and we need yeah. to be very much aware of what we're getting of what we're getting ourselves into because this is a slippery slope and it's not one that you can go back from yeah he he did say that recently and it's funny because i mean tesla is absolutely embracing autonomous technology like that's probably what's putting them ahead of a lot of its competitors beyond just you know battery storage and the fact that they're sort of first out of the gate on electric vehicles but the autonomous piece is what people are saying is going to think is going to be the thing that really drives tesla's growth because of maybe there's this model of having sort of a a self-driving taxi right um, and if you combine that with ride hailing like Uber, it's like it's going to shift the entire way we transport and move people. So it's interesting that he says that the fact that there needs to be regulatory bodies looking at this stuff because it is scary. And the, and the, the part of it that is scary is, you know, artificial intelligence is kind of like this big, from my understanding, this sort of um, wide sort of category of casting of, of, of saying how you're having some sort of technology mimic or replicate kind of human behavior and and, and sort of human thinking. But then you can break it down into subcategories, which is like machine learning. And then there's now this deep learning. And the deep learning part is really, for me, is what's kind of more scary. Because the deep learning part is where you actually develop sort of these artificial neural networks, right? And so so the way I I think I'm going to use this analogy correctly, hopefully I am, is that like in the brain and do you know, like there's like a cerebellum, it's kind of like your mini brain. And so the cerebellum is like, for people who don't really know this, it's kind of like, if like, let's say if I'm about to pick up a pencil, your brain will say, okay, this is the way you pick up that pencil. And and this is the way you close your fingers and so on. And so when you're first doing that movement, it's sending a copy to your cerebellum and then it's evaluating that copy. And so then if you if you don't grab it correctly, your cerebellum is really the one that's kind of making that adjustment, right? And it's and it's doing all this, it's all doing all these things to kind of learn and refine that skill, right? And that's the processing insane. power of your human brain is, is is crazy, right? And so to be able to mimic that processing power in some sort of some an actual technology is is my understanding is kind of a, a limiting thing, but they're really the processing power is is growing as well like so, so yeah sorry and so like if, so like if you um so if your patch wanted to learn how to play guitar and you whatever wanted to learn four or five riffs first time you go through the riff it's going to be hard the hundredth time though it's going to be much easier and the thousandth time you're not even going to think about it because you're kind of building these like neural pathways right that are kind of learning and mm-hmm. as you do them they sort of fuse together and then all of a sudden it's like this um well-known path that your brain can kind of walk along you don't have to think about it so you're telling me the machines can do that, that like that like what this neurological thing is, is that like they can build skills and become better and kind of form these right. neurological pathways. Right, it's through an iterative kind of process. And That's all it takes scary. is just a massive amount of data. That's the thing, right? It's just all That's data. Scary. Like we, our brains are constantly taking at an unconscious level all this sensory input through a number of means, right? Through all our senses. And so we're constantly processing data, right? And, and every part of our brain is doing work on that. And so the same thing for these artificial neural networks. It's just a matter of giving a ton of data and they learn. There was this really cool video I watched and people can, people can find it on, on YouTube about, um, about deep learning. And they're showing like the number nine and they're like, if we wrote the number nine in these three ways, 
how does deep learning kind of figure that out? And so it's like it, it looks at that number nine and it identifies these pixels. And it's the same way the brain kind of does it. Because if our brain saw three different versions of the nine, we would know that that's still the number nine. And so it, it kind of processes it along, like in our, I guess in our brain, we would process each part of that, um, that, 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 that drawing of the number nine. And then it would trigger certain neurons. And then we would essentially be able to iterate that, okay, this is the number nine. Right. And so an artificial neural network, they're trying to make it so that it does the same. And that's already kind of happening. Like that's already happening in, in, you know, for example, um, I think like Google translate, for example, like when you go to a web page and it says, Hey, translate this information. Like it's able to look at those characters and be able to like just translate it. And if you've ever seen like convert to English, like it converts it like almost perfectly. Right. Um, from what I've seen. So mm-hmm. that's like a, maybe a quick example of, of, of seeing deep learning in action. And so that's, that's like now. the last step, right? It's like, it's, it's almost entirely mimicking the human brain. It's one thing for, for us to be able to tell a machine and then it kind of learns based on inputs that we give it. But the fact that it's going through its own artif- iterative process and developing its own neural network uh-huh. is, is incredible. <clears throat> so just and think that- about how that's going to shift the economy right and the scariest thing is almost your comment about the exponential increase in technology over shorter and shorter periods of time mm-hmm. and how i mean it, i think i got my first cell phone when i was just out of high school and it was the, it was just at the time it was a pretty sweet phone it was like this flip phone and whatever it was cool and you can call me wherever i was and that was pretty cool and then my friend got this one that had a camera in it, and we were all just like that's insane like like that's insane like cameras yeah. and phones right yeah yeah and then like probably 4 years later every single every single camera had a phone or sorry every single phone had a camera in it mm-hmm. and now you're getting like I have a DSLR camera that's like 14 megapixels and you can get a cell phone that's probably has mm-hmm. like 11 megapixels mm-hmm. And and like that's insane. And now pretty soon all cell phones are going to have that. And so this is an, so like we went from landlines to cell phones to cameras and cell phones to every single person in the world almost having a cell phone with a camera in it. Mm-hmm. Um, in a in like I don't know thirty years. Well, and that and so that that's yeah. Think about in from the start of the third industrial revolution. So they're saying probably like late nineteen forties. I think it was um, from what I read. Just think about all the different technologies that have been eliminated, yeah. right? A lot, a lot of that had to do from moving from analog to digital, but it's just been crazy how many different iterative technologies we've had. And and the fact that we are doing that in a more compressed timeline, is it is scary. And so, yeah, so, so like the reason that that's scary is because now all of a sudden you're telling me that there are machines that can kind of mimic human brain learning and, and like building neurological pathways. And it took us a lot of years to get here, but it's going to take, but now imagine, you know, in, in five years, we are going to be much further along than we would have been five years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. only going to increase and increase and increase. And so the rate of learning is insane. And where do you, like, where do you go from here? And I feel like we always, every generation has said that. And every year somebody says that like, like what's next? Like what's Mm -hmm. possibly next? And it's only going to get, it's, it's only going to get, more and more autonomous and more and more able and more and more, um, I don't know, frightening. But we should probably be excited about it too for all the opportunities that are sort of arising out of it. But I can only think of Terminator and I can only think, have you ever seen the movie uh, Deus Ex Machina? No. Oh man, you got to watch that movie. It's insane. It's it's actually sort of, so there's this guy who's like, uh, I don't know, like the Mark Zuckerberg or whatever of his generation. And he, he's this rich guy and he's really in to like developing AI, developing AI. And he invites this, I think like a journalist out or something to kind of uh, stay with him and, and just like see what he's doing. And he's like secretly developing these robots. And one of these robots like convinces the journalist to like fall in love with the, anyways, it's just this whole thing about how like this robot who's like AI learning, kills all these people and like nuts dude but i mean but only because she like learns that she wants to live and she wants to be free and Mm. in order to get her freedom she has to kill some people and trick this guy into fall in love with her and anyways uh i don't um summarize movies for a living for a reason because that that was pretty awful but 
anyways, I only think of like these extreme negative scenarios where things turn out bad for the humans. Well, and yeah, I mean, the kind of what we were talking about earlier, I think that's the natural, that's probably the natural line of thinking is people are going to be thinking, we've already had a ton of automation. Now you're saying that, okay, really, what role is there for us in society, right? Yeah. Like, or what? Like, how do I make a living? And I think from what I'm gathering is people see this though as a, as a, as you mentioned, a, a, a time of immense opportunity to sort of right some wrongs that have been created by previous sort of disruptive times, like these other sort of revolutionary times, you know, mm. inequality can go either two ways, right? You could have this further accelerate where you have the people who have, who are the innovators who have access to these, uh, to these technologies who have access to this cap capital are really going to benefit from an economic standpoint um, and are going to grow. And then people who don't have this kind of access are going to suffer, right? So you could have that, or you could have, you know, you could, the economic model could change. We could have, this could be a place of where you have more of a circular sharing economy, right? Where mm -hmm. people are generally all benefiting. It doesn't mean that you're just moving. It's not a shift between, you know, a communist society and a, and a sort of free market liberal society, but you have something that's kind of a blended that captures sort of the, the benefits of, of both in 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 alongside with all these sort of technological disruptors and so people are saying this could be an opportunity to make some huge shifts on the economic model side um hmm. it could be it could be it could be a place for people to work in more rewarding and um in more challenging challenging fields i mean i, I think from what i gathered from the first industrial revolution and the second is everyone was always thinking like what's it going to mean for me and it's it's a huge point of change it's just I think there was a lot more time for the for, for people to change. There might not be that same benefit this time. And so that's why for, I feel like this is a really interesting topic for us to kind of explore because I think people need to be aware of thinking about, okay, as they're working, what are the what are the things that they need to focus on? Like I'm already starting to think about like what are the skills that are really going to matter? Creativity is going to be huge, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's going to be something that I'm not sure if like deep learning – you know, it'll learn a process to make sure that it maybe gets an answer right, right? But it does it have the ability to also be creative in generating some sort of output? I don't know. I mean, that's something for us to ask somebody about who knows this kind of thing. But but I feel like that might be certainly a place for us to really focus our skills. Like that would probably just be one of them. I'm sure there are a handful of others where we could still sort of, I don't know, maybe outperform is not the right word, but you know what I'm trying to say, where yeah. we can sort of have the upper hand, so to speak. And I think if you look at, the, I mean, the results of, like the outcomes of each of the previous industrial revolutions, yeah, there were some negative impacts of sort of that technological advancement, but quality of life absolutely improved. I, I would mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. guess, right? Certainly after the first one. I mean, yes, you know, there's some, um, major environmental impacts that came out of that that people weren't aware of at the time, and now we're kind of seeing the effects of those impacts. But, you know, for day-to-day -day life, quality of life had to improve, certainly in the first one, probably the second one, likely the third one in, in a lot of ways. And so I would wonder now if, and I, I don't know if this is part of sort of this fourth industrial revolution, but, like, what about if you had cancer and instead of having to go through chemotherapy, which from what I understand, is just an awful, awful, awful experience. They injected nanobots into your, you know, into your bloodstream, and these things kind of sought out um, your cancer or your, or, your, or your malignant tumors or whatever it was, and sort of destroyed them from inside without having to kill every other cell in your body or whatever. Like I'm, I'm just guessing here. I don't know if that's actually happening, but like, what, like, what if these outcomes continue to improve our quality of life? You know, so as opposed to like the Terminator and the Deus Ex Machina's. Uh, that I worry about, there's obviously going to be some positive things that that come out of this. Um, oh, for sure. From a healthcare standpoint, like you kind of already, I'm not sure about nanobots, but I mean, there's like things I, like, I don't know. <laughs> but there's, you know, personalized medicine, being able to actually get some genetic screening and testing done. Now, I'm not sure I trust every single company out there, but right. you know, that's another conversation. But the fact that you can kind of get this information and you know, there's CRISPR technology. I don't know if you heard about this, where you can actually gene edit, right? And so uh, you can. That's isn't that, I mean, so there's a lot of things that, like, there's a lot of genes that that you would want to remove, right? For, but, yeah. I mean, I feel like that's a slippery slope. 
Like, like what if, you know, after you, like, what if you can design a kid? You're like, actually, I want a blonde kid with blue eyes as opposed to whatever. Like, yeah, I mean, that'll that's, happen. You're talking about you're talking about the embryo level. I'm talking about people. I agree. I'm not saying that. It's, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm sure people are not. I'm sure people are thinking about that. I'm sure this active conversation. Uh, but I'm talking about people who are already, um, who know that they potentially could have this cancer uh, because of this gene that they already have. That you can oh. actually sort of crisp it out and and sort of you know almost. Um, I'm I'm not talking with a lot of intelligence here, but my understanding is that you can sort of edit that genetic sequence, and so that that person wouldn't be predisposed anymore to getting that cancer. So, like, there's hmm. there's some revolutionary technologies um, that are that are out there that are just going to continue advancing that could really benefit a lot of people. Uh, but the other thing I would say is, you know, even on the energy side and on the environment side, sh- certainly there's been a huge quality of life improvement from, you know, just on an economic standpoint from those first sort of two to three industrial revolutions. But as we know, there's been these external externalities that have kind of that have come across that have arisen because of that. And that's be, been because of the destruction and the use of a lot of natural resources. And so here's an opportunity for us to, to really address that and to create an economic model where we actually can preserve and and hopefully benefit the environment at the same time as really truly raising the quality of life for people. So yeah. Sure. Anyways, That's... I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping that you're down for exploring this topic some more and that we can really find some interesting guests to really tell us more about different aspects of this revolution that seems to be occurring. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm it's a uh, super interesting topic and i wish i knew more of, like this is one of those things and actually we talk about this a little bit um when we talk about this podcast about how this is a great forum for us to you know think of or learn more about things that are interesting to us and i i really like the, you know this project for us as a tool to kind of learn more and this is something that i wish um you know i knew more about and it's it's such an interesting topic uh and i think it's so it's so relevant and so topical and I mean, it's going to impact our children's lives, and it, you know, for, for sure. you would absolutely hope for, you know, for the better. And it sounds like maybe you're a bit more of a glass half full guy, and I'm really coming across as the glass half empty guy here. But um, yeah, no, I, 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 I think it's a natural thing, though. Like, I, I, how could you not be? There's, it's not like there's parts of me that are not afraid of this, but I, uh, it's, I guess it's more like, what choice do we have, right? Like, you, we have to adapt really quickly on this one. It seems like. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's also. Like we always like to think, and, and I've kind of said this before about like um, when we're talking about parenting advice and like parenting books and all that stuff. And each each book that comes out is like this is how you do it, not what those idiots were doing thirty years ago. Whatever. Like we've now got it figured out. And I feel like probably at the end of every one of these industrial revolutions, they were like this this is how you do it. Like those idiots in the first industrial revolution. Right. Now we got nineteen forty. We got this shit figured out or whatever. And so I wonder sort of what the long-term impacts will be of it too. But it's an incredibly interesting time to be alive. And I think that there's some – I mean, we always sort of try to touch on, I guess, you know, uh, fatherhood and parenting and all that stuff and sort of what the mm-hmm. impacts are to our children. And if you look at even even now, like there's studies that have shown with social media and sort of the impact that that, that has on kids. And, yes, it's it, it can be a really positive tool because it allows kids to connect and allows just about anybody who's interested in anything to find a community that – um, is also interested in, in in that thing, no matter how niche it is. But also now, depression rates are through the roof in adolescence, and it, you know, it's it seems to be there are certain linkages to higher depression rates with kids who spend more than two hours uh, a day on social media, and it mm-hmm. it's different but, um, between boys and girls. But uh, it's it's I think an interesting time to be alive, an exciting time to be alive with all these technological advancements. But I also don't think that we'll n- fully know what the repercussions are of these tools that we're developing for years and years to come. And what an interesting time to parent. And how do you how do you stick handle all this stuff? Like mm-hmm. you, I don't even know what Instagram really is or TikTok or all this stuff. And we joke about it, but our kids are going to be on that stuff oh, or easy. something similar, right? Like, um, it, you know, it, it'll be some new social media app by the time they get oh, onto yeah. it, but. Yeah. We're so far out of the loop now. How can, how are we possibly going to understand what those apps or tools or whatever they are at at that time are and how they work and what the impacts of those are going to be? 
So I don't know it's 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 exciting because there's a lot of positives to it. There's a lot of things to learn too, and I, you know, in a time to be raising children and to be sort of young parents, <laughs> I don't know. It's exciting, but it's also a, a daunting a bit too because I'm not interested in in that stuff. I don't I don't take a personal interest in that stuff, but I sort of need to because it's it's going to be there whether I like it or not, and I can understand it and sort of help guide my kids through it or just be ignorant to it and see what happens i don't know weird weird um weird time to be raising kids well it's gonna i mean it's not only our kids it affects us man affects the two of us and and how we you know we're not we're not that retirement age yet right we still got however many years and and we gotta we're gonna have to adapt ourselves so it's it's uh relevant for our kids and relevant for us so anyways if if you guys have any thoughts about sort of how we take this topic, please leave some comments. If there's some people that you think we should talk to, leave some comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, but I think this is going to be a really cool topic to explore. So I appreciate uh, appreciate your time. appreciate you. Uh, you know, I know you're a busy guy, so I appreciate you coming back to the show this week. I hope you can join us next week, but we'll have you when we have you and and then obviously have you as a more and more regular basis going forward. So. Yeah, buddy, happy to be back, and hopefully be involved as much as I possibly can. And, um, yeah, I'm just happy to be chatting with you again, pal. <laughs> okay, appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, appreciate you. Thanks, okay, see you.